maybe on the scale was very heavy. Maybe in an exhibition open day, you gave someone a booklet or a Quran. Yeah, you handed it out, here's a Quran. They took it away and they contemplated, they read it, they, they studied it, right? This would be amazingly powerful. So keep that in mind that someone accepts, you know, they start acting upon some good, even some element of good, you'll get rewards for this, right? So this is very important. Like I said, I'm going to skip a few slides. I want to get to the characteristics of the person that's giving dawah. What do you think some of the characteristics are of the, of the caller? What do you think are the qualities of the person that invites? So you said, brother, it's inviting. Remember you said a dawah is to invite. What do you reckon are the qualities of that person that invites? 100%, yeah. you need kindness, yeah? Kindness, you can link it to gentleness. So if you're going to be harsh or rude, foul language, pushing people around, getting aggressive, that's going to fail. In the dawah, that will fail badly. You have to be kind, gentle. You know, the hadith talks about rifq. Whoever puts gentleness in any matter, it only but beautifies it. And whoever removes it, it pollutes it. It ruins that matter. No matter what it is, whether it's speech or actions, you, you, you like pollute the matter. So you want to be kind and gentle in everything. Make that extra step and effort. Have that kindness. Because the non-Muslims will observe that and they'll gravitate towards the Muslims. They'll say, you know what? Muslims are some of the kindest people. Right? They're the most gentle, kind. You know, they gave me this as a gift. When it was Ramadan, they shared food with me. The neighbors come and see me in hospital when I was not feeling well. They were the kind ones, right? Honestly. And you know, you'll be surprised because I travel a lot of the country and you know, non-Muslims are out there and they're just waiting for this dawah. You know, some of our guys, they, a long time ago, was they, they went to a place called Glastonbury. You've probably heard of it as a rock festival type thing there. The Glastonbury area in the, in the Wiltshire, I think it is, right? So they went there and they started doing door-to-door -door dawah, you know, knocking on the doors, door-to-door -door dawah, right? So when they reached one house, they knocked on the door and the door opened and the non-Muslim man there, he said, where have you guys been all this time? He said, everyone's come to our doors. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the Christian type people, the Jewish, the Hindu, the, you know, the, what they call those, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the Baha'i, the Baha'i faith. All these other ones have come to us, right? But the Muslims haven't come. And he literally said, where have you been all these years? That's what the response was from the man at the door. Literally was like, we wanted to hear about Islam. So people are curious, people are searching, people are on a journey. There's many non-Muslims out there, they're reading the Quran, they're studying, they're looking into it, they're on a journey, they want some truth, right? So this is really important. So kindness, gentleness, anything else you can think of as a quality characteristic, <coughs> anything else you could uh, uh, think was, would be important? Patience. Patience, yes. Imam yeah, if you're not going to be patient, the prophets were so <laughs> patient, they undertook uh, you know, rejection, ridicule, scorn. If you're not patient in the dawah, like street dawah for example, right? 90% of it is going to be rejection. Like most people won't take a booklet, somebody may make a remark, somebody may take the booklet, throw it in the bin. A lot of people will take it and just put it on the bin, in the bin at home or on the shelf. Lot, uh, most of it's going to be rejection. 90% of dawah is rejection. If you get used to that 90% rejection and you don't lose your patience, you'll be the best at dawah. I can give you that assurance, right? You'll be an expert in dawah. Because you'll know in your mind, I'm focusing on the 10%. The kind person I met, the one that was interested, the one that will read the Quran. These are your little triggers, right? So patience is right up there as well. What do you think is the primary characteristic? Wisdom. Yes, well, right. wisdom. wisdom is very important. Hikmah, yeah. yeah. Putting the thing in the right place, right? You don't want to like, um, you know, if there's a guy walking along, he's got a walking stick or in a wheelchair. Or sort of, let's say his leg is bad, he's got a walking stick. He's very old and you've got a spare chair there. It wouldn't be wisdom just to talk to him in the street. You say to him, look, you want to take a seat? I can see your leg is bad. You take a seat and then bring him a drink, water, whatever. That would be wisdom, you know, because when you're judging the person, reading the person. But what do you think is at the top of all the qualities of the da'i? What, what would be right at the top? No. Uh, yes, brother. Knowledgeable. Knowledgeable? Yeah, you need knowledge. You can't make up things and, and lie about Islam. That's very important. That's one of the qualities. Yeah. Someone else said something around here. Yeah, I think. Having a welcoming, you know, yeah, welcoming demeanor, yes. yeah, you know, like you don't look aggressive, you're welcoming and stuff like that. Yeah. Sisters on the on the right, have you any ideas what do you think the top one is? Sincerity. Sincerity, brother, exactly. That's the number one characteristic. If there's no sincerity in your dawah, it's finished, right? This is why I mentioned it in the beginning. I was kind of hinting. I was hinting that this is a key theme throughout the course. Ikhlas, absolutely essential, right, for the Muslim. Because there's no value in deed without sincerity. And shaitan will try his best, he will attack you. You know, when you start giving dawah, he will work extra hard to stop you. So how does he stop you? He comes and attacks the intention. 
right? He will come, he'll tell you, do the da'wah for this reason, for money. That's your primary objective, get money, yeah, get fame, get a following on the social media, get, you know, your family says good things about you, your reputation increases, just to get a name and fame. This will be a worldly dunya reason, right? And your sincerity will be under fire, basically. You see how shaitan works? He knows when you start giving da'wah, because for him, it's terrible. When you start giving da'wah, it's a, it's, a, it's a nightmare for shaitan, because he's calling people to jahannam, and you're calling people to jannah, you're doing the opposite, so he wants to stop you. He won't leave you. Right? Dao is easy. Don't get scared now and you know, get worried about shaitan. Dao is easy, but shaitan wants to stop the dawah, basically. He wants to stop at any means. He wants to stop you seeking knowledge, uh, doing dawah, doing good deeds. That's his main aim. He wants to slow you, stop you, and he wants to pull you to the other side. Get doubts about Islam, get weak in your iman, leave Islam. That's his overall aim. That's what he's there for, right? So sincerity is very critical, right? Other ones you mentioned, like a brother on the right here, on the left of my, my left, sorry. He mentioned, um, you know, knowledge and clarity. That's essential, right? You know, you must have knowledge. Don't base things on ignorance or emotions, unknowns. Character, like the brother said at the front here. I think our brother was at the front here. He basically said kindness and gentleness. That's essential, right? Very important. Um, and they're the sort of top qualities. There are many of these qualities, right? Um, so fitra comes into it as well, which is important because you want to uncloud the fitra. When you're giving dawah, you know, because people get clouded fitra, you know, they get covered. They, they, everyone's born as a Muslim, but they get uh, polluted. Their fitra gets covered, right? And you want to uncloud it, and you can do it in different ways. The Quran does it. Life experiences. You know, somebody has an experience, like for example, childbirth. That's a big experience. When that happens to some non-Muslims, they start to think about God. Uh, you know, my wife nearly died. It was just something that I it was a miracle. Could it? Could there be a God? You know, this is what they start thinking, right? So. I'm going to go ahead a little bit. Now, what do you think are difficult questions you could be asked about Islam? Like very difficult, tricky questions. What could somebody ask you? What do you think the problem is with this? The full yes. marriage. The what, sorry? The full marriage. What's that, sorry? Four marriages. Four marriages. Yeah. I didn't know what you are saying. Four, yeah. yeah, four wives. Yeah, they, they say that's not good and not allowed, shouldn't be allowed or whatever. Yeah, they have resistance there. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, that's a good one. We'll cover that briefly in the course as well. I am keeping it brief, right? Um, what about what the brother said? Think about, you know, husband and wife. What, what's common on attack in Islam? Age of Aisha. Age of Aisha, that's very common. Go on, brother. Yeah. No. Age of Aisha, yeah. They say, you know, prophet married a young person. This is not good, you know? Even though the irony is that they're kind of like heading in that direction themselves, you know? Not that it was paedophilia, but they claim it's pe they, they, their claim is Prophet Muhammad was a paedophile. But what's happening now, you've got the LGBT stuff, right? But you've also got the maps. I don't know if you know the new term, the maps. That's the new one. Normalizing, uh, you know, this sort of uh, unimaginable stuff with minors. Minor attractive people, that's what maps is. That's the new phase that's gonna come. So these LGBT groups, you know, they're like angels compared to what's coming. These guys mutilate themselves, they have operation changes or whatever, they do it to themselves, but these maps, they go to an innocent child, you know, that could be six or seven, and they will essentially, you know, try to consent and do things with them, right? And this will be the future problem coming up, right? So anyway, um, and we know Prophet Muhammad SAW was far removed, it was not, you know, it was the norm of the time to marry at that young age, right? It was done by others as well, communities, not just Prophet Muhammad SAW, even British kings did it many years later, very young, you know, hundreds of years later, whatever. It was a cultural norm, right? Anyway, I don't want to get into the details, but can you think of any other difficult questions that could come up? Yeah, they say the Quran is not from God, it's from the devil, not a book of God, copied on the Bible, you know, you copied the Bible, there's all these claims, difficult ones. Any other difficult Sharia themes? Law. Yeah, Sharia, Sharia law. And what could you link that to? What's the wider narrative that's been going on for so many years? What do they accuse Muslims of being? Terrorism, 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 isn't it? The big one is terrorism, right? For many years, you Muslims kill people, Shias killing Sunnis, kill, 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 you're bloodthirsty, you know, all these claims of terrorism. It's nonsense, right? We're actually peace loving, but they say you're like killers, right? Um, so that's another big, big thing that goes on. So all these difficult questions somebody might ask you from any angle, they may ask you about the terrorism, the age of Aisha, yeah, and all these difficult, difficult things, you're gonna get stuck, right? So I'm gonna teach you the technique which is known as the go-wrap approach. 
like I say, I'm going to share the notes with Brother Faraz for the course. So if you missed anything, don't worry, don't panic, you can go over it. You can learn how to give da'wah through the notes, through the course. But the go-rap approach, has anybody heard of the go-rap approach? Okay, some sisters put their hands up. Anybody, brothers? Imam Abid has heard of go-rap, brother at the back. A few hands going up, right? So the go-rap approach is a simple method. We've used it for many, many years in our charity. Um, and it's this acronym here, so you can see it on the board. Basically, you've got God's existence in blue, oneness, revelation, which is the Quran, and prophethood, right? So we want to use it as a map. You don't have to use it as a rigid structure. If you miss out one letter, it's not the end of your dawah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, if you didn't talk about the, for example, um, the Quran, yeah, but you still said that, you know, Allah exists and he's one and there was prophets, you covered a big ground in your dawah, right? But essentially, you want to run in the sequence. So it's like an acronym that you lodge in your mind and it stops your mind going blank. Because you know you might talk to a non-Muslim and you're talking about something, halal meat or whatever. But you don't know where to steer it, do you understand? So this thing gives you the, the structure, right? Or the guidance, right? So you want to practice it, make it your own. And we'll go through the steps, inshallah. So there's some initiation initially, it could be active or passive, you know. Active is like street our team, Brother Faraz is going to take lead on it, inshallah. You go out, you give out leaflets and booklets, you meet the public. That's active dawah, and it's uh, my argument or my understanding. It's more rewarding because you're getting, you're doing more active dawah, right? Passive is where someone comes to you, you know, your colleague at work. You didn't eat lunch with us the last couple of weeks. You were away from us. You tell them it's Ramadan or Muslim. I'm fasting, and then that's sort of passive dawah, right? So that reactive sort of thing, right? Um, now, what's important when they ask you that difficult question? Oh, you know, why can't you do X, Y, Z, or this and that? What comes in first is your character. That's very essential. Character is key, you know, how you behave with the non-Muslim, the people around you, your character. That is critical. Then you bring the concept. And this is where you don't answer the question directly. So if someone asks you, oh no, you know, um, whatever the question is, it could be many ones, you know, why do you wear a hijab? Why do your women cover? Whatever the question, you do not answer it directly. You say to them, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for asking. However, in order for you to understand the answer, I need to go over some of the basic principles of Islam. You see what you did? You brought it to the foundations, the Tawheed. Does that make sense? Like if I ask you guys, why don't we eat pork as Muslims? Precisely, brother. Yeah. It's not for any other reason. <clears throat> the reason we don't eat pork is because Allah has commanded it. That is critical, right? Somebody may say there's another reason. It's unhealthy meat and this thing and that thing is you know, unclean. They're secondary sort of reasons. The main reason we don't eat pork is in the Quran. Yeah, Surah Baqarah, do not eat the flesh of swine. That's the uh, primary reason, because Allah commanded it. In fact, everything stems from that. Why do you pray? Allah commanded it. Why do you use a miswak before you do your salah? Allah commanded it. Yeah, these commands, these recommendations and commands and sunnahs, right? It's all from Allah. So we always refer it back to, because our Creator told us to do it. Once the non-Muslim gets that and he understands it, he will become a better Muslim than us. You know, he'll excel. They'll become the best of Muslims, and that's what you notice among some reverts. They become, they race ahead of even the born Muslims, right? In the competition of doing good, right? They become really good. Some of them shine, right? So, so basically, uh, you want to bring it to that that concept. You can word it in your own way. Now, that's a brilliant question. Thank you for asking. Remember, you won't use this in every conversation. You don't want to be orchestrated and and look too rigid, robotic, right? You want to make it natural and good. Sometimes you will answer some of the questions. You know, say to them, "Good question. The reason why we, we don't do it." Or whatever. But if you're getting someone that is a bit, maybe you don't know their intentions and you want to use the method, feel free to use the method, right? But I'm not saying it will work in absolutely every single situation. You have to read the person, read the situation, right? Then you look for an agreement. Do you have a few moments for me to explain uh, the basics of Islam? And maybe the person agrees. Maybe he's like, okay, please explain to me Islam. And now you're giving the dawah. See how you put your foot in there without getting lost in an argument or difficult question, or point of contention, or somewhere where you may get, you know, hot under the collar, where you're firefighting, you're trying to answer questions, you don't have the evidence, you don't have the reference, or whatever, you're stuck. But you reverted it back to the basics of Islam, and now you're giving them dawah. Because you want to be in that mode. You want to give them dawah, not them giving you dawah. That's very critical, right? So, some of the cases will be like, you won't be able to use the go rap, right, as we mentioned. This bit I can skip. Now, I want to look at God's existence briefly as we go through go rap, right? So how would you articulate a convincing case for the existence of a creator? How would you prove God exists, let's say, as a Muslim? 
How would you prove that God exists? I would, I would say a lot like the big bang theory. So yeah, that's good. The crown that we've created, the universe is created by it, but since we've found it. Excellent. And I would say there's no way my there's a point of view. Like good, good. So you can bring that proof and evidence, that's Quran, that's Quranic that's stuff. That's yeah, that's, 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 that's excellent. That's Brilliant. That's Any other arguments you could bring? Mm-hmm. You're, right, you're right in the right area of another argument. You know your argument about the universe and the Big Bang. These yeah. are all these are big things, big science, right? Yeah. So what can you build on that? What do you notice about the universe? You need to have a creator. You need to have a creator yeah. that's clear cut, yeah. right? Of course, yeah. The, the, the first cause. Yeah, of course. You need an uncaused cause. You need a lot of creator. An uncreated creator has to be there, otherwise you get a problem. Yeah. And the infinite regress and this. I don't want to get into the deep stuff, but you'll get a problem, right? You need the starting point basically. Even the atheist might say, oh, we believe in evolution and we came from monkeys. Or what created the thing in the first place? That, you know, that fish that became a walking thing or whatever, and then it becomes a monkey. If you believe in that, something had to start it. And that's where a creator comes in. So yeah, talk about Allah, talk about God. That's fantastic. What I want you guys to think and understand and know is that most people out there in the world, the majority, they believe in a creator. Right? Because of the fitrah, they have that belief. Right? They may not call him Allah. They may say higher power something out there, some may, some may say God, like Christians or whatever, they'll use a different names and terms, but they believe in some higher power. And I reckon about 60% of the people out there, 70% of here, maybe the UK is a little bit less, but if you go to Africa, Philippines, where we do our work, whole villages accept Islam. You know, 300 people will say Shahada, mass village, all saying Shahada, because they're more upon the fitrah. They haven't been corrupted like the big cities, London, Manchester, Birmingham, the big cities. Home. <coughs> Which Hull, big city, yeah, can't miss Hull, right? So big city, you know, these big places, these cities, they corrupt the, the lifestyle. You know, there's humdrum, there's rat race, there's paying bills, there's consumerism, there's, you know, shops and business, all this stuff that pollutes, right? But in the Africa, in the deserts, in the Philippines, people are more on the fitra. So in your dawah that you'll do, you will not be spending 48 hours, ten, you know, uh, three weeks or whatever, convincing and proving to that person that God exists. Right? You may for some, you may do long-term dawah for some person, like a stubborn atheist, you may work on him long-term, but for the rest of the folk, they're going to come to the right uh, point on the table. They're going to say to you, you know what, look, you're a Muslim. I'm not a Muslim, but I believe in God. They'll tell you immediately, straight away. Especially in street dawah, those environments, online dawah, these places, they'll tell you the, what the level playing field is in the beginning. They'll say, I believe in a God, a creator. Now it's your case of explaining what, who is that creator. You know, so Christians believe it's Jesus. Hindus believe it's Ganesh. This one believes that, this one believes that. We have to explain who Allah is, how he's the true creator, right? the only true God, right? So any other ways, any other arguments? Think of the universe. Think of the bottle, look at the bottle. What do you notice? What design features do you notice of the bottle? It's like shaped, isn't it? It's shaped, right? It's not the size of the cupboard over there, which you couldn't lift if it was full of water, yeah? Anything else you notice about the design features? The color. Color is green, yeah, good, so they're giving it a color maybe to be different from the clear ones or whatever. But in that vein, it's transparent as well, isn't it? Look, you can see the liquid, transparent. It's got, you know, this ability to see the level of content in there. So it's done for a reason, a green transparent color. Anything else that you see this here, label, lid, to stop it spilling out, yeah? You don't want to spill it in the mosque, get the, you know, the masalis will get angry, upset, in wet floor. You know, it's got a base, it's flat on the base. All these are design features, loads of them. We could be here all day, right? So these design features indicate a creator, creator designer, God, whatever you want to call it, a higher power. Something created, somebody created, Allah created it, right? So look at the universe, like you said, brother, even more complex than the bottle. This bottle is nothing compared to the universe. Or, or your bodies, you know your bodies? What happens in the body, the systems, what's going on, you know? The body is so complex, the most complicated machine. If you cut yourself, right, after maybe an hour, half an hour, it grows back the skin. You know, you get a paper cut, it's repairing, it's a self-repairing machine. That's what Allah has given us as this gift, the body, where it's so complex, right? And they don't know what's going on, you know, there's things they're discovering just recently, little microscopic things that you, you, you never heard of, like in the brain. They discovered in the brain an open-ended artery, maybe with an electron microscope, and it drops out like a drop of blood onto a tissue membrane. What do you think the brain is doing, or the body is doing? Yeah, kind of. It's doing a blood test, basically. It's testing its own blood. You know, we think old-fashioned. We think you get sick, you go to the doctor, you get a blood test, right? And um, you know, you have to go through these steps and all of that. But this body is checking its own composition. 
in that part of the brain is, is analyzing the blood. Is it too much acidic? Is it too much alkaline? Should I secrete more from the, the insulin, the liver, the kidneys? What should I do? You know, it's, it's an amazing thing that they don't fully understand. How can they understand? It's so complex it's from Allah, right? So these sort of arguments you can bring. Look, could it come from nothing? Could the universe come from nothing? Nothing comes from nothing. Simple philosophy. Nothing comes from nothing, right? And you know, when you think about these things and you argue and you explain, you know, you, you can get really deep into these. You don't want to get too deep and confuse yourself. Like if I ask the question, can the nothing exist in the real world? What do you think? Mm. It can't, can it? You can't get this concept. It was, so you have to understand things simply from the Islamic angle. Allah has always existed. He's transcendent. He's eternal. Yeah? He's al-awlu, the first. He has no beginning. Al-akhiru, the last. He has no ending. He's eternal and absolute, right? Meaning he's been there before time, space and matter. And there was nothing. Right? And then he willed and created the creation of the universe. Right? But the nothing cannot exist in the real world. So when the atheist says, oh, we came from nothing, or you know, there's a random chance accident, they're not making sense. Right? But we believe you know, that Allah is a creator. It's, it's very simple. Don't confuse people. Right? So that's excellent. The simple design argument. You can bring it to maybe an atheist or someone that's being a bit, you know, like playing around or he's stubborn or whatever. He doesn't believe in God. You can explain it. Look at the mobile phone. Look at it. You know, it's got these design things that the glass, the metal, the buttons, the programming of the coding on it. Somebody had to design it. Somebody had to create it in a lab or whatever. Blueprints and coding and algorithms. It's so complex, right? So what about the universe? Could it have come from nothing? Surely there's a designer. Look at the complexity. Dark matter, supernovas, yeah, all this complex stuff in the universe. Allah says in the Quran, what's out there in the universe is even far more complex than the body. The body's got such complexity, as I mentioned, DNA, the, the camera of the eye, the hearing, all the senses, everything is so complex. But the construction of the universe is of a higher power, so it's amazing, basically, right? Um, and you just look at the sun. You know, the sun is a giant nuclear fusion reactor. If you bring it closer to the Earth, the sun, we're all going to die, we're all going to melt. We're going to die in deserts everywhere. If you take it further away, everything freezes over. So there's another balance argument there as well, the fine-tuning argument. That everything's in perfect order, right? Uh, gravity, perfect, right? The temperature, the sun, the distance, everything, the mass. It's all in this thing, they call it the Goldilocks zone. It means it's just right for life, yeah? So there must be a creator, because it's, it's just, it can't come from randomness, right? Um, and so there's all these sort of arguments, like the Big Bang, as our brother mentioned, you know, look, does chaos give rise to order? From chaos, you don't really get order, right? So this is, a, this is all science. But like I say, brothers and sisters, I want you to focus on the Dawah. Know that most of the people you'll encounter in your everyday experience, they already believe in a creator, God, or whatever. You've got to steer them to the fact that Allah is one. That's the next letter of the go rap, right? So obviously you get an agreement, you know, does that make sense to you that God exists? The guy's either going to say, yes, I believe that God exists, or he's going to be stubborn. Like the stubborn atheist, he's going to say, no, I, I disagree, I don't, want to, I don't want to know, I don't want to agree. If he doesn't want to agree, give him a Quran, give him a booklet, give him some extra dowels and information, and let him go on his way. There's no point trying to force the square peg in the round hole, you know. There's many folk out there looking for the truth of Islam. Focus on them, inshallah, right? You don't have to put all your eggs in one basket. So, oneness, how would you guys prove that God is one? Like what would be the proof that God is one, basically? Because it's just saying that he's, he's the only one that can sustain everything. It feels like more for God. So yes. It, 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 like, I, good, I good, excellent, brother. Brilliant. Right, so look, what you've got is, you've got the verse in the Quran, had there been other gods besides Allah in the heavens and or the earth, both realms would surely have been corrupted, you know, fighting each other, right? So glorified is Allah, Lord of the throne, far above what they claim. It's in the Quran, chapter... 21 verse 22 so multiple gods will be what conflict of wills do you get it god a wants to make it sunny in hull tomorrow right we've got a nice sunny day that's god a god b wants to make it rainy raining right and this is theoretical of course we know there's only one god but this is a theoretical hypothetical right so these gods are going to be at loggerheads conflict of wills if if it's sunny then god b couldn't have been a real god because he couldn't make actualize the rain Right? If it's rainy, then God A was the false God. If they're always in agreement with each other, there's only one will and there's only one God. You understand? That's the simplicity of it. There can only be one God, right? And um, you know what's interesting about the verse here, if you study the Arabic, if you go to the Quran, what Allah is saying, obviously there's a lot of rhetoric and parables and, and magnificence in the Quran, but basically it's saying, 
had there been other gods besides Allah in the heavens or the earth, Allah doesn't even give them the honor of being transcendent gods, like he is himself. Does that make sense? In the heavens and the earth. He's already belittled them in the rhetoric of the Quran. Right? Meaning, it's impossible. Because if you've got the all-powerful, which is who Allah is al Qadir, you can't have another the all-powerful. Right? Even the T-H-E, the the, indicates he's one. So oneness, again, a lot of people out there would agree that God is one. Most people. Maybe a staunch Hindu. But even the Hindus, they're ignorant of the teachings in their books. The common Hindu folk, they don't know. In the teaching of the Vedas, Bhagavad Gita, you know, their sacred texts, it talks about one God in their own books. They don't study it, they're common folk. Yeah, they're ignorant and they just go to the idols. Does that make sense? They really studied their books and they were quite genuinely sincere and they you know, uncovered the, the pollution, let's say, or the, the falsehood and they came to the truth. They would believe in one creator. Sikhs as well believe in ultimately one creator being, right? Yes, Imam Abid, yes. It's not a question, it's a request. No. Go on. One of the brothers very kindly bought ice cream for everyone. Did he? And it's, I'm afraid it's going to melt. Okay, everyone crack on. <laughs> Shall we, we you, with, with this sort of weather, you need the ice cream. A quick, a quick break or? I think we can. Oh, you if wait? it's not too messy, can they eat at their chairs or? Or we'll take a, you know what, we'll take a three minute break, inshallah. Yeah, give them a break, inshallah. I think they deserve it. They deserve it, they deserve it, yeah. Especially <laughs> with this um, weather, you know. Oh, oh, inshallah. Oh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, so we'll resume in about nice five story. to five <laughs> to six, we'll resume, inshallah. Five to six, inshallah. If you need a cup of tea and beef, one go first. Wow. Can leave one packet with the sisters and the rest can be left. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. situation or whatever but people are you know at different points in their lives some are not ready to accept yeah um, and what you've got to ask yourself is like what piece of the jigsaw is missing with that sort of person so the sister said like you might explain to someone God exists and he's wild and do all this dour technique and all of that but the person rejects right or oh, says they're not ready their lifestyle's good or whatever the fundamental problem there is they've not understood the tawheed the basics right they would understand if they understood it remember if the majority, or sorry, the population around us, the non-Muslims, if they understood Tawheed and Islam in its purity, they would be coming to Islam in droves. Does that make sense? But there's a disconnect, uh, a misunderstanding, you could say. They don't have the light of Islam. So with such an individual person who rejects, and you know, normally it's excuse mongering, if that kind of makes sense. I don't mean in an absolute sense, I don't mean every non-Muslim, but what they're doing, what they tend to do is put something there to appease, you know, to keep themselves looking good or whatever. It's a natural human thing. You don't want to say, oh yeah, I like worshipping my desires and following my desires. And that's not what the non muslims not going to say that, right? It, look, it doesn't look good, right? Because it looks greedy and horrible, right? So that's not what they're going to say. But at the end of the day, in, in effect, they may be saying that, in, but not in those words, if that kind of makes sense, right? They, you know? So with, with that particular individual, you need to go back to basics, you know, explain to them in a clear, clear, clear way, you know, that God is one, Allah is one, give them some evidence, proof. Let them go on their journey if they need to. Some people are on a journey, they need more time. They need certain things happening. Remember I mentioned experiences. For some person it may be an experience, something happens. They're driving with their family and their family's behind them in another car. That car crashes, they lose all their loved ones. Their parents, their, their cousins, their children, all dead. They were with their wife and some other friends in the car in front. The other car goes and crashes. That experience may shock them, and they get shocked into this sense of like, I'm shocked, I lost half my family, you know, is there a God? They wake up, yeah? So that may be the path for that person. For many people, it will be the Quran, which we'll talk about in the go-round. The Quran is a big motivator, a big catalyst, right? So 
you know, people will make up many excuses, yeah, many excuses to not worship Allah. They'll say there's another God, there's this reason, there's that reason. And it's like, it's hard to decipher each and every case. But like I say, that individual that you mentioned, sister, he or she has not understood the basics of Islam, hence they're rejecting. Does that make sense? All they've understood and they're arrogant, and they are, you know, rejecting. Does that make sense? That could be the case. Some of them may have the, the deep understanding as well, and they're rejecting, right? So there could be many cases. We don't know the hearts, but we just give the dawah and we move on, like I say, then we move on, and you're going to get all manners of cases. You know, like I mentioned last time I came, the extreme atheist guy that was out there, you know, there's an atheist, right? And he basically was said, it was said to him, that if we could give you conclusive proof that God exists, would you worship him? And he replied, no. He said, no, I wouldn't. So I then asked him, why? What's the reason? We're going to give you proof, something that works for you, that God exists. He said, I wouldn't worship him. And they, and they asked the next question, what's the reason you wouldn't worship the, the God? And he said, because I don't want to think or believe there's something better out there than me. So now, at least he was honest, right? At least he was honest, and he was to the point. But this is the thing we're talking about. You know, the fear, the arrogance, the rejection will be amongst some people. And it's highly dangerous. It's highly dangerous, right? Because that's going to be, be a block. A blockage between them worshipping Allah and coming to Islam and it will be a barrier and a block. And then we leave the rest to Allah. Allah will judge everyone. Some people will go to the hellfire. Some people will be maybe have their own test or whatever. Now some people the message didn't come to them clearly. Right? I, I kind of in my view from my experience, I think that's a number of people in this country, the message hasn't come to them clearly. So they're getting a mis message, a mixed message from the media, a wrong message about Islam. Yeah, Muslims themselves sometimes give the wrong impression quite often, right? Because in the state, the Muslims are in a weakened state at, the, at this time, which we know that Muslims are not in a you know, uh, thriving state, you could say. You know, we're in a weakened state. So the resurgence of Islam, Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. Many non practicing Muslims are becoming practicing. The future, is, no doubt, is for Islam. Islam is growing. The future is good. There's no doubt. But there's, the, there's peaks and troughs of the Ummah. There's peaks and troughs, right? And we're definitely in a trough, but we're coming up. We're in that little curve. You know the curve at the bottom? So it's a very bad time for the Muslims. You know, you see Palestine you're getting oppressed. You see Burma, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, Muslims being killed everywhere. So there's peaks and troughs, but the Muslims are coming up. And there's, a, there's a resurgence of Islam. So it's a good news for us, right, overall. But we've got a lot of work to do as Muslims. We've got lots of work, right? You know, I don't want to uh, divert away. So we've done the O of Goran, it's about the wills of God. That's the best way to explain it. Just bring the God A, God B. That's what Allah's done in the Quran. It's hypothetical other gods. It's hypothetical, it's not, not saying other gods. Yeah? Even though look, there are other gods, that makes sense. I want to get my word wrong. In English it can sound coarse. There are other gods. There's Allah, there's other gods which are worshipped, which are false gods. Does that make sense? Because on the day of judgment, yes please, Imam Muhammad, yeah. No sugar, just milk. Yeah, just after the phone. So there are other gods which are worshipped falsely. Does that make sense? Because in the Quran, on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, Allah will say, bring your gods besides me, the other gods that you're referring to. But they're false gods. There's only one true God, which is Allah. So there's other false gods. Does that make sense? Not true gods, right? Um, so anyway, uh, so there is a link between G-O and R-A-P that we mentioned. It's more to do with like, you know, Allah provides for us amazing things, physical needs. Look what he gives us. You know, Surah, um, Surah Rahman, you know all the blessings, you cannot count them. You cannot count the blessings of Allah, you know, your eyesight, your hearing, all the physical stuff He gives us, food, shelter, clothing, loads of things, you can't miss them. Emotional needs, He gives you wives and children, you know, He gives you company and family and parents, grandparents, He gives you so much for your emotional needs. What about your existence and spiritual needs? Surely this creator being wouldn't just create you and then say, just go run amok. You know, run, run everywhere and do what you want, start wars and start stealing and doing oppression. You wouldn't do that, right? He'll give you the existence, the purpose of life. And non Muslims ask these pertinent questions Where are we going? Is there life after death? You guys remember COVID. Look at the non Muslims and the people, Muslims and non Muslims. Look how it shook them up. Am I going to live tomorrow? My family is dying. Yeah, my manager is in uh, IDC Newcastle, in another DAO organization, and he buried something like 25 people with his own hands at the janazah of the people that were dying from COVID. Newcastle was one of the worst places for COVID, right? So these questions come along, they get shocked, they ask the big questions, where are we going? Is there life after death? Is there a God? Am I gonna die? These are big questions, trust me, non-Muslims will ask these at some point, whether they were young, old, 
Maybe they ask it many times, maybe they ask it infrequently, maybe they pad up their lives with lots of desires and pleasures and try to mask it, but they will have asked these questions. And one of the questions they ask, big one, is what the sister said, the problem of evil and suffering. She, the sister mentioned that, you know, why is there suffering in the world? Very briefly, um, what they say, it's a very old problem, it's big at this time, that's why we bring it in our course, it's very big in this current age. They try to say, you know, your God, he's uh, the most merciful, the most powerful, all powerful, right? Then why the evil and suffering? That's what they try to say, right? So it's called theodicy in philosophy. It's an ancient problem, but it's not a problem for the Muslims. So they're saying your God is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most merciful. Then when the tsunami comes, where was the mercy? Why did he send it, right? And at the same time, he's Al-Adil, the all-powerful, has total totality of power. Then where was the stopping of the tsunami, making the waves go calm? Why did he allow, where was the power then? So the mercy and the power is what they bring. How would you brothers and sisters answer it, in particular, this particular so-called problem? It's not a problem for the Muslims at all, It's not a problem for the Muslims in any shape or form at all. It never has been, right? Even though some Muslims are falling for the science narrative and they're leaving Islam, you know, we hear about Islam, the world's fastest growing religion, is a training edge that Muslims don't want to talk about. The Muslims leaving Islam, murdad and whatever, that's a problem in the... In the, in the another, another argument as well, but what, how would you answer it? They're saying, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, and Al-Qadir, then why is evil and suffering? What would you do as you ask? Remember, the clue is in the question. Because he knows everything, and that's it. So there's not purely evil, kind of. Absolutely. Every, every that's it. Happens. Yeah, that's it. So that, that's, there's a number of points there, yeah? What you said about he knows everything, that's a clue, isn't it? Like if Allah knows everything, al alim the all-knowing, right? But also Al-Hakim, the all-wise. Totality of wisdom, right? Allah knows absolutely everything. Past, present, future, what would have happened if had something that happened differently. He's got the complete picture, we've only got the pixel. So Allah knows everything, absolutely everything. What you're thinking, your inner thoughts, everything, right? So when there is this evil or suffering, we know that behind it, there's wisdom. Yeah, there's wisdom, and where there's wisdom, it indicates reasons. Where there's a source of wisdom, it indicates reasons. So there's a reason for the apparent evil and suffering. Does that make sense, everyone? A reason, that's with Allah. We can't always access the reason, but we know it's with Allah. Does that make sense? Right, so when the child, for example, say a child dies, very sad for the family, very tragic, the 10-year-old dies, the little boy, right, he's passed away. How do we know? The reason could have been, remember what I said, we don't know the reason, we can't see the unseen, right? But it's with the all wise. Because Allah's got a perfect wisdom. Hikmat al it's called in Arabic. Hikmat al is a perfect, all encompassing wisdom. Complete picture, we've only got the pixel. So when that child died of 10 years old, maybe the reason was that child was going to grow up and become the next Adolf Hitler and start a nuclear war and kill. 3 billion people in the world, innocent and non-innocent, whatever, he's going to start a major war. So Allah took his life, what does Allah do? Puts him in paradise, because he's a child under the age of adulthood, so he's already win-win, and, and 3 billion people are saved. So we see it as complete evil, like the brother saying, there's no such thing as absolute evil, it doesn't exist in Islam. Absolute evil doesn't exist, right? Even shaitan, you know, we say that, oh you might say, but he's absolute evil, he wants to kill us or whatever, he wants to make us do kufr, and shirk and go to the hellfire forever. But even in his past history, there was a time where the narrations talk about there wasn't a hand span in Jannah where he didn't do sajda. So he was that of a high level, but he became fallen, right? So the, the, the point is, things look like complete evil, they're not the case. Does that make sense? I mean, obviously when that child dies, we don't say to the parents, it was for the good, and they say, you know, we go with sympathy, we empathize, we take them dinner to the hospital, we feel sorry for them, we're, you know, we're not, we're not going to say mourning, but we're saying to them that we're very sad for your loss, we give you, you know, we'll help you with your chores, we're your neighbour, you know, we feel so sorry for you, you know, you know, hopefully he's in a better place, you console them, you do all the steps, right? But at the end of the day, even in the, in the tsunami, as we know, when the tsunami hits the people and they're Muslims, where do they end up? Jannah, isn't it? They die the death of a sheep because they're, they're drowning, right? The Muslims that die in a fire, so there's fires. The Muslims that die in earthquakes, Syria, the other one in Turkey, yeah, the, the buildings collapse on, on them. The Muslim that's killed unjustly, murdered, right? Someone stabs someone, tries to bug him, puts a knife in his chest, kills him. He's killed unjustly, he dies death of a shaheed, right? The, there's so many of these cases. So again, what the person is trying to say, oh, your God, he sends lightning bolts and tsunamis and all this stuff, right? They try to make out 
Allah is some sort of evil Lord, astaghfirullah, you know, that he likes gratuitous suffering and pain and evil. It's not the case. Because that water going in your lungs for maybe three minutes, right? If you've got a short capacity of lungs, two minutes or whatever, it's going to be pain and suffering, no doubt intense, for a momentary time, but then you're instantly in paradise. If you were a good Muslim, and obviously you, you bypass the day of judgment, you're immediately in the paradise. Does that make sense? So look at the situation. Momentarily, two, three minutes, and then infinite life. You cannot uh, thank Allah enough for this, right? Because what you'll get, you know, in mathematics, it's like zero and one. This finite life, this worldly life, is like zero, and the paradise is like one, zero and one. You're talking about finite, maybe you live to 100, and infinity, that's the reward in paradise. So what Allah's giving you, we, we can't, we don't deserve it basically. We don't deserve paradise at all, right, us guys. We don't deserve paradise, you know, we can't thank Allah enough, right? And you know, it's very interesting, this sort of stuff, right? So, so the point is, it's not a problem for the Muslims. There's many other sides of the argument, but they try to make Allah like a, a limited God. They try to say, oh, all merciful, all powerful, and then, but that's not the case. Allah's got many names. The scholars of Islam say Allah's got an infinite number of names that are with him. Yes, the hadith talks about 99, but that's a particular hadith that if you enumerate, memorize the 99, you enter paradise. But there's more than 99 names, there's an infinite number of names with Allah. Does that make sense? So this is the creator being, and this is good in the da'wah, and you should bring these sort of arguments. Explain. I like to bring it in my da'wah, I like to say, you know, to non Muslims when I'm giving them da'wah, I'll say to them, look, you know, when BMW makes a car, they don't really make the car, they manipulate already existing materials. So they take the wood from the trees, they make the leather, the wood gear stick or whatever, right? They take the hide from the cows, they make the leather seats. They take the metal from the ground, iron or whatever, steel, aluminium, they make the plates of the, the body panels, right? So they manipulate already existing materials. They don't really create the BMW, that makes sense, in the true sense. But when Allah created, He created with no materials, nothing there, when there was nothing, He truly created. Does that make sense? The true creation. So Allah is the true <coughs> creator. And there was no prior example. So BMW, the company, they go to university, they have teachers, everyone in there has a prior example, a teacher. Allah has no teacher, no prior example. He's the true creator. So this kind of puts things in their context for the, the person that's getting the dawah, they begin to understand, okay, that's the God you believe in. That's the one you worship, the true creator one. Um, so basically, we're moving on to the Quran now. So what would you, brothers and sisters, how would you talk, what would you say about the Quran? In your dawah, what would you bring? How would you explain the Quran to a non-Muslim? What would you say? How would you explain it? You know, what, what would be going on? I'd say it's like an all guidance for life. Good, excellent, brother. Mashallah, that's brilliant, right? So, like a, a like a guidance manual, isn't it? Right, that's a good phrase to bring, an instruction manual. So sometimes I play a role play with non-Muslims. I'll say to them, look, you know, when you buy a gadget, smartphone, you know, uh, whatever it is, gadget, TV, laptop, whatever these gadgets are, camera, whenever you buy that gadget you get a little booklet with it, the instruction manual. It's got the do's and don'ts, the instructions is all in there. The Quran is like that, it's an instruction manual, but for human beings. So now the non-Muslims understand it, because remember, the average non-Muslim is not accessing the Quran in Arabic. Because that's, when we talk about Quran, we talk about the, the Mus'haf in Arabic. They, the best that they can get is the English translated meanings of the Quran, yeah, which is in English. That's the best, but that's not the Quran. That's the English translated meanings of the Quran, right? The Quran is in Arabic, so they're not going to get, unless it's a Christian Copt who speaks fluent Arabic in Egypt, who then becomes a Muslim, he'll have a better, because they use the word Allah in their Bible and stuff like that. So that's an excellent way to bring the Quran. And there's many things you can talk about, but my advice to everyone, keeping it short, because I'm looking at time, um, you want to basically just bring as much Quran in the Dawah as possible, as much as you can. Hand out Qurans, give out the English translated meanings, Recite the Quran, read Surah uh, uh, Ikhlas, explain the meaning of the translation, say he is Allah the One, the absolutely eternal, he, he does not, he was not begotten, nor does he beget, and there's nothing like unto him. Really, recite the Arabic, let them hear it, because this is powerful, guys. You know, the Quran is the big thing that we've got. It's the miracle, yeah, it's a timeless book, um, it's a perfect book, there's no inconsistencies, there's no flaws, no one's been able to copy it, you know, replicate the Quran. Even that daft website that I read about 10 years ago produced a chapter like it, made by some non-Muslims. They claimed that they had broken the challenge, that we produced a chapter like it. So I went to the website and thought, let's see, let's, see, let's see these guys, let's see how they've made the Quran, right? And I went to the website and literally it was a cut and paste job. They took a little one ayat, 
of Surah Baqarah, one of Surah Ali Imran, because what else can they do? How else are you going to produce a book? There's no blueprint for the Quran. It's a miracle. There's no blueprint, right? All Arabic language comes in, there's 14 rhythmical forms, either poetry or prose. I believe it's seven poetry, seven prose. Any language that exists in Arabic, you can categorize it in one of the 14 categories. So you take a newspaper, you say it's prose, is that style of Arabic, it goes in there. But when it came to the Quran, when it comes to the Quran now, uh, linguists, grammatarians, poets, the best in language in Arabic, they cannot put it in any of the 14 categories. It breaks all the norms. It's a miracle. Right? That's what a miracle is. It goes out of the norm. Because why can you categorize every other language, or every other, sorry, written text or source, why can you categorize that, but not this one book? Does that make sense, right? So the Quran is a miracle. No one could imitate it. And that website produced a chapter like it. So they did a cut and paste job, right? They basically took a little bit here and there, glued it all together. That's very disingenuous, right? Because they can't produce it like it, right? Um, that's why I think Allah mentions, or some scholars talk about, you know, the Alif Lam Mim. That thing, you know, people don't, if you're going to replicate the Quran, you'd have to give meaning to that, if that kind of makes sense. But that cannot be explained. It's like that it incorporates that challenge to the people produce a chapter like it or produce a book like it. You can't do it because you don't know what those letters mean. Right? So no one could do it, right? Anyway, if anyone would have done it, produced a chapter like it, who would it have been? The Arabs at the time of Prophet Muhammad were the best in Arabic. If anyone would have broken the challenge, it would have been them. Not that anyone can, and they couldn't. So no one's going to do it because they were the best at the language. Christine. Because languages undergo linguistic degeneration, all languages, English, French, Arabic, all of them, they degenerate over the centuries. So the English we're using now, you'll lose words, and there'll be new new terms and slang and stuff like that, whatever, bent words or changed words, right? So it will alterate, it will alternate, sorry, it will, uh, it will alter, sorry, over the years, right? Anyway, so I read that, produced a chapter like it, I read what was the Arabic there, and when I read it, it didn't give me any feeling that I get when I read the Quran in Arabic. You know, the Iman boost you get and the feeling you get connected to Allah, the rhythm, the feeling that you get. You can't explain it. When you read the Quran, you get a particular feeling. That wasn't there. So I, I was literally looking through and said it just was like nonsense. That makes sense. And where is this website now? Half of you guys probably don't even know about it. It's called Producer Chapter Like It. And they claim that we've met the challenge of the Quran. We've done it. We've, broke, we've proven that you can produce the Quran or whatever. Nobody even knows about this website now. They've all failed. Anyone that's tried to make the claim has failed. So it was interesting. There's a gentleman out there on YouTube, a non-Muslim guy. And he said he only gets peace in his life when he does one thing. An ordinary guy. He's got family, works in a job, kids, everything. He said, when I go to this uh, skybox, or whatever you call it, sat satellite system, I go to the skybox, I put on one channel, the Quran channel. When I listen to it, I get peace that I cannot explain from any other, any other thing in my life. Nothing in, a, in his life gives him that peace. He admitted it, he made an interview. The ordinary guy, and he, and he admitted it all. The only time I get this level of peace which I can't explain is listening to that sound, the Quran. And that's what the Quran does. The revelation of the Quran unclouds the fitra. Does that make sense, everyone? It unclouds it. You know, Allah talks in, in uh, what is it, Surah Nur. Allah talks about Nur and Allah Nur in Surah Nur. The first Nur is the revelation, the Quran, and it impacts the fitra. The second Nur is the is the fitra, right? So the one Nur, the revelation, the 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 the, the wahi, impacts the fitra. It unclouds it. That's why even that time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the Sahaba, the people, the the people that are coming to Islam, the reverts, they said we heard a chapter, a verse, or something, and our hearts flew. Where they came to secretly listen to the Quran, the Kaaba, or wherever the cases were, and they would secretly listen to this poet, what they thought was poetry, this amazing speech, and they would be enthralled. They would be like, I've never heard anything like it. It's not music, it's not poetry, it's nothing like we've ever experienced. And the hearts would fly. Yeah, and that's the power of the Quran. So, this is what I'm trying to get into your minds, brothers and sisters. Have that relationship with Quran, read it as much as you can, study it, learn Arabic, seek knowledge, do all the good things of Islam. That's critical, right? Keep up that effort, and you'll notice when you give more, um, what do you call it, effort or um, emphasis, sorry, on the Quran in your dawah, you'll find your dawah is a dawah times 100. Does that make sense, everyone? Right? It's amazing. Um, now, okay, so go to the next bit. It's going to be, so this talks about a lot, lot of what I spoke about, you know, preservation of Quran, no one can imitate it, clear message of who God is. Universal message is for all folk, yeah, whether they're in the Amazon forest or in New York or wherever the people are dotted around. You know, falsification test, actually the history in there, multi-layered nature, you know, there's many layers of meaning on verses and stuff like that. Um, and you know, obviously, 
you don't, you, this book is very good. If anyone wants to order this book from our uh, distribution hub, it's called The Eternal Challenge um, by Brother Abu Zakaria. It explains the miraculous nature of the Quran, how it's a miracle. There's a lot of non Muslims that are confused. Is it not like the Bible? They've got misconceptions and stuff like that. So finally, we move on to prophethood. Um, so this is the P of Gora, yeah? Um, so how would, what would you talk about in terms of prophets? What would you say, brothers and sisters? Let's have some input from the sisters, since they've been quite um, quiet on that side. So what do you think, sisters, about prophethood? What would you talk about? Okay. <coughs> Any particular part, pieces? Maybe uh, we need to be aware of different prophets. Say that again, sorry, so I couldn't quite catch what you said. You said Allah sent prophets or? Yeah, Allah sent the chain of prophets. Perfect, that's fantastic, sister. Yeah, look, Allah sent many messengers, many prophets <coughs> Adam, <coughs> Moses, Noah, Jacob, David, Solomon. Explain them in English to the person. It all came with one message. That's critical. <coughs> many prophets, one message. That dawa line, that strap line works really well. <coughs> you many, you know, you know, little um, sticky examples. We call them sound bites. Many prophets, one message. Yeah? If there was no evil, you wouldn't know what good is. The whole problem of evil and suffering, summarized in a simple English statement, if there was no evil, you wouldn't know what good is. People kind of, they react to that better. Because we're in an information overload era. There's loads of information. You've got the world's biggest library in the palm of your hand, the internet. All this information overloads. People are becoming like into a rat race, right? So they get the, the, the little sticky example in the dawah, especially street dawah, works really well. Does that make sense? Because they can absorb it, they go it, they remember it, and they reflect, and then they might start reading, googling, researching. You know, there's a Reba brother, he's based in, uh, where is it, Basildon, right? And he's a young guy, and mashallah, you know, he was at college, and he's like walking around, whatever. And then there was a sister that was becoming more practicing, you know, wearing hijab, starting to pray. And she mentioned to him, she's like, you know, you should look into Islam more, or the Quran, or something like that. So he went home. He started Googling about Islam. He came across the Ayra website, right? And then he started finding out more. And then he reached out to us guys, Ayra. And he came to our offices. He actually came with his father. He was very young. He was only about 21 or 22. He came to the Ayra offices. He took Shahada. He accepted. And, you know, he went on this journey. He came to our new Muslim retreat program, which we do. He, he did our mentoring scheme. He completely finished it. Uh, he did all these amazing things. And then some, not too long ago, back in July, he went back to that sister, you know, the sister that told him look into Islam, and he proposed to her basically, he asked for her hand, and these two are now married, mashallah, sure, 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 sure. married, sure, sure. settled down, he's <laughs> planning to go on <laughs> Umrah, make dua for him, he's, you know, he's become a practicing Muslim person, only because of that line she said to him, you should look into Islam more, that was her dawah basically, can you believe it, in college, very young guys, very young people, right, so you know, Allah opens the doors, so basically, that's brilliant by the sister, Specifically about Prophet Muhammad you know, we've got these three, some people say four. Brother Hamza Maya of EF Dawah talks about deceived. But we'll keep it simple in our course. You can bring three or four. But either he was a liar, Elder Billah, Prophet Muhammad was a liar, or he was deluded, speaking falsehood, thinking it's true, or he was truthful. So why do you think he couldn't be a liar? Yes. yes. Perfect, brother. Mashallah, excellent. Mashallah, you've been answering a lot today, mashallah. Excellent, my brother, right? Mashallah. So look, even before prophethood, he was known as a sadiq al amin. Even before prophethood, a sadiq al amin. People would lead to riches.
from each other. So basically, so he could be a liar. No, the Sadiq al Amin, absolutely impossible, right? The most documented man in history, no indication in any hadith anywhere that he lied. And you know, this hadith is very important because it's all um, testimony that he was a truthful person. You know, absolute huge amount of evidence, massive amount of evidence that he was a truthful one, right? And you know, the science of hadith, you can look at it, the mutton, the text, the narrators, they checked everything, their memory, trustworthiness, character, whether they lied at all at any time. There's a whole load of testimony there. There's strong evidence that he was not a liar, right? Stronger than many other sources of, of history and stuff out there. So deluded is when you speak falsehood, but you think it's true. So why could he have not been deluded? What do you think, brothers and sisters? Why could he have not been deluded? Prophecies. Prophecies, brother. Excellent, right? So give me a prophecy, bro. Hmm. Can you think for of myself? It? No, 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 not for this. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, sense of humor is good for that one. Well. Yeah, of course, of course, sense of humor is characteristic, yeah, yeah. What do you think? Any uh, particular famous prophecies that Muhammad came with? There's so many. Where the, um, the uh, people would fall at the Battle of Badr. Okay, he predicted that and they'd fall. Excellent, right. Yes, the, uh, the fall of the Romans. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's good. Okay. Good. He said the end times are not taking place until the bad yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Were you at the course before, brother? No, I just... Oh, okay, 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 mashallah. So, so basically, um, that's the one I was going to talk about, the tall buildings. <coughs> so the, the prophecy is that the barefooted, unclothed Bedouins will compete in the construction of tall buildings. So in the Dubai, in the UAE, you've got the Burj Khalifa, 828 metres tall. And in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia, the Jeddah Tower, I don't know if it's completed yet or they're still building it, I don't know. But it's going to be one kilometre. So they're literally competing, the Arabs, and these were Bedouins. So the Hadith is very specific. This is what some Muslims forget. They yeah. think, oh, but there's other prophecies. Nostradamus, Alistair Crowley, uh, Joseph Smith. But these guys were pot shopping. They were not prophecies, they were not prophecies like Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. Sallallahu They were guesstimating, right? Like, I'll give, give me an example. Uh, Joseph Smith, right, of I think the Mormons or well, one of the Christian groups, he basically was in the world of politics, you know? Imagine you've got Rishi Sonak and the politicians, he was in that world. <coughs> so when he predicted the civil war in America, he kind of could see it coming as a, as a good estimate because he had the inside information. So it wasn't really as people think later on, the common folk thought, he prophesied it, it's a miracle. You know, they get really bamboozled, right? But this is very <coughs> specific because at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, some of the Quraysh, they would actually build their buildings into the ground because it was cooler down there in the basements. So the prophecy is saying that these Bedouins, these guys are literal Bedouins, are going to build buildings taller than mountains, right? It was like a revelation, a shock, that how will this happen? But only 50 years ago, in the UAE and Saudi, when the oil was discovered, those same Bedouins, they were literally Bedouins, no buildings in the UAE, so no big, tall buildings, no fancy buildings, they're now competing. The next it might be Qatar versus the next guys, or whatever, or Oman, or whatever. These, these Bedouins are competing, right? So it's very specific, and it's come to pass. And this is what it is. If he was speaking falsehood, how can the prophecies come true then? Same with the Quran. If the Quran is from Prophet Muhammad and he was speaking falsehood, you would see inconsistencies in the Quran, contradictions, and things wouldn't make sense. But instead, it's a revelation over 23 years where it brings nothing but goodness to society. Subhan. Yeah, the most unified people out there, a group of people that don't drink alcohol, you know, teetotalers, are the Muslims. And you know, even 20 years ago, I heard that 70% of all crime in this country is committed under the influence of alcohol. That's 20 years ago, approximately. I don't know what it is now. You know, how many crimes under alcohol, right? And the Quran says, do not drink. So it brings nothing but goodness, right? So there's no way he could be deluded from different angles, Quran, prophecies, whatever you want to bring. The only conclusion is, <coughs> conclusion, sorry, is that he must have been truthful. And that's what we believe as Muslims, of course. So you can bring many other angles as well in your da'wah as well. You can talk about how he looked after the orphans and the elderly, how he honored the you know, the truthful, sorry, how he was honored, you know, the truthful, trustworthy, you know, um, his enemies even attested to his truthfulness. And why do people lie? Look, if he was a liar, people lie for two main reasons. For protection, right? The little child takes the Samartis, and then they say to mum and dad, it, you know, this thingy that took it, the sister or whatever, to protect themselves, they lie. Or for gain, right? So definitely he was offered all the riches, and he turned it all away. So he couldn't have been a liar. He was offered everything, the wealth of Mecca, 
the power structure, <coughs> the politics, the wealth, the gold, silver, you name it. He was, they said, we'll give you all the riches, just stop your message. And he didn't do that, right? Um, uh, so it wasn't for gain, right? And definitely he wasn't protecting himself. He got attacked all the time, <laughs> didn't he? He got physically attacked. He went to Daif, the children stoned him. He was attacked, there was wars, there was... There was a lot of hardship for Prophet Muhammad so, right? So it's impossible that he was doing it for those reasons. He didn't have a psychological profile of a liar. He never did Prophet Muhammad so, ne never did he just not lie, he didn't even he intend to lie. You know, the leads that talked about he intended to lie. He's not even coming I mean, close to lying. He was the truthful one, right? And um, that's where we're going to end, inshallah. Obviously, you know, if a shahada happens, then I mentioned our mentoring system, you can hand them over to our charity. Uh, we can pair them up. We've got uh, 50 trained mentors, brothers and sisters. They, they teach all these reverts all the time over the phone. It takes about uh, 12 weeks to mentor, etc. But what I want to do specifically as I came on this journey is try to spearhead or start that team, the new street dower team in Hull. Right? That's our plan going forward. If we can grow it, if we can do it, it'll be very good. Brother Faraz is going to take lead on it, but he needs help. He needs brothers to step up. So if anyone, who would, can I get a show of hands who could... Who could uh, commit inshallah? Even if it's for once a month, yeah, you come out on a Saturday, even for one hour. Imagine you come for that hour. Imagine that's the thing that Allah put you in Jannah for. So you shared the message with Because I didn't bring it in the course, but there's also, very quickly, last story. There's a, there's a negative side to it as well. The selfish Muslim mindset is very dangerous. That we keep Islam to ourselves. That's dangerous. Right? Because there was a man that was destroyed in a village. Where around him was all bad people. And he was a good person, a good Abid, a good worshipper. But then the, the, uh, the time of punishment came, Allah said, destroy the town. The angels flew down to destroy it. They saw the Abid, they flew back to Allah, and they said, we can't destroy this town. We know the people are very evil around, but there's one <coughs> Abid, one good man. And the reply to the angels was, start the destruction with him, because he never gave dawah at all. He kept Islam in his heart to himself. He never shared it with anyone. No intention to share, and he was destroyed. So we don't want to be destroyed. You know, we're living amongst non-Muslim majority. We're a minority here. We should be giving da'wah. I think my view is to live in these lands as, as Muslims, we've got to be sharing some message at least to others, the wider message, because we've got the truth, right? So this street our team, you can approach Brother Faraz, you can volunteer, you can come, whatever the frequency you guys decide is up to you. Tomorrow we're going to go out, right? Tomorrow's Sunday. So we're going to go out into the city centre, we'll choose a location from about 11 o'clock when the shop's open to about 1 o'clock. We will do a little bit of street da'wah, uh, shadowing session. If anyone wants to join, you're welcome to come. Because I've travelled here with two volunteers. Um, who are they? I'm trying to remember now. Because I've travelled with so many different volunteers. Brother Daha, he's experienced in Dawa, so he can shadow with a few people. And Brother Rashi, he's quite experienced now, he's been on quite a few trips with us. He can shadow as well. So if we had, so even if it's like uh, 10 brothers, we can put them into groups of three and just find a location where we can hand out the books. Brother Faraz will bring the books, the materials, that we'll hand them out. And we'll do a couple of hours, we'll get uh, you know, warmed up. Hopefully, inshallah, look at the weather. It's not as bright as today, but there's no rain uh, on the day, in the morning at least. And we can do this dawah session, inshallah. And then you'll get this love for it, and inshallah, we'll keep the team going as long as we can. I'll be setting up a lot of teams across the UK, in lots of locations, Bradford, Coventry, um, Maidstone. I've lost track of all the places. I've traveled so much, but they're all starting dawah, and they're continuing. Bradford's very strong. Young guys, they're only about in their early 20s. They come out every Saturday, they hand out books, books, books. And you know, who knows where that book is gonna go, brothers and sisters. Because the one book you give, it could go to someone that his whole family then become Muslims. So this is why I want to end. Uh, we'll get ready for the Salah very soon. If there's any questions, you can take them now, related to Dawah, of course, and the course that I gave. You may have a specific question, uh, whatever it is about Dawah, we can, we can discuss it. Yes, brother. If you give some books uh, there, <coughs> throw it in a bin. Is it a sin? Uh, no, at the end of the day, brother, we don't put any Arabic in our booklets. So we don't put the actual Mus'haf Quran. It's in English. But we put Obviously, the name of Allah you put in the English. Name of yeah, as far as I know, brother, it, if it's the name in English, right, it's not a sin as such. It's not a sin. Obviously, it's a bad, it's a loss of the book or whatever. And some people will do that. They'll bin it. You know, they'll take it from you and chuck it in the bin. But you can't, we can't track all of that, we can't control it. I think Imam Abad wants to know. Yeah, if somebody comes to you and says, give me a leaflet, I want to throw it in the bin, then don't give it. <laughs> but if somebody takes a leaflet and puts it in the bin, then you are not, yeah, like somebody said you are not responsible yeah. for them doing something. Exactly, something. like in commentary there was a bin man, you know one of these guys, has got one of these, like, uh, what do you call it, Trolley, yeah. bin truck, yeah. And, it, and I said to him, would you like one of these books about the Quran? 
And he's like, yeah, just chuck it in the bin. <laughs> so I just left him, I walked away from him, and I knew he was going to wind me up, right? So obviously you're going to get foolish people, brother, and there'll be some that throw in the bin or whatever. But it's not a sin as in, you're not getting the Quran and chucking in the bin, or Allah's speech and chucking in the bin. It's something written in English. It says the word A-L-L-A-H. Is that sacred, the A-L-L-A-H? I don't know. I don't, I don't, as far as I know, it's not sacred Mus'haf, right? But it's wrong for them to throw it in the bin, and we would take it out of the bin and clean it or put it somewhere better. But look, again, you know what it is, brother? It's a shaitan that's putting these sometimes these thoughts in our minds that we think this is going to happen and negativity. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's your town, it's your city. At the end of the day, there will be foolish people and there will be good people, right? And you've got to ignore the foolish or, you know, just tolerate the foolish and focus on the good. That's the main thing. You know that story I gave you guys last time about the man doing street dower in London? Do you remember that story? And the lady came to the dower stall, right? So this is an amazing story. So there's a brother, he had all those characteristics, and I believe he was really sincere, because I couldn't do this myself, right? But he was at the dower stall, he had all his books, what are we going to do tomorrow? And he's giving dower. English lady comes to the stall, she's really upset, you know, angry. Look at this guy, immigrant in our country giving dower. We can't give dawah in their countries if you go to Saudi Arabia and call to Christianity, they'll put us in prison. We can't open churches there, all this stuff, right? So she's got a chip on her shoulder. She came to the stall, she spat in his face. She spat in the middle of his face, right? In the middle, in front of everybody, right? And the thing about the brother, this is why I say I believe he is very sincere. MashaAllah, Allah bless him, right? He was smiling all the time. He wouldn't break his smile for anybody, right? And he's smiling, he's handing out the book, he's smiling and welcoming people, smiling, smiling, smiling. He was emulating Prophet Muhammad When she spat in his face, he kept smiling. He didn't get angry, he pulled out a tissue from his pocket, he wiped it away, he gave her a tissue, she's got spit coming from her face. He gives her the tissue and she ran away into the crowd, she disappeared, right? She went home for two weeks, three weeks, whatever, some time passes. She's tossing and turning in bed, she's trying to understand what happened that day. This so-called terrorist, he's smiling, I spit on him and he's still smiling. It didn't add up to her. He poked the right buttons. So she, so she came back to the Dawah stall and she accepted Islam. She became a Muslim. Yeah, amazing. You see the point, brother? Yeah. So at the end of the day, people praying in the deen and this and that. Yes, yeah, some bad things can happen. You know, some, what, what's the worst that can happen? You know, somebody may come and he's drunk or something. You, you're like a brother's there. The brothers will be at the table and we fight, but we contain it. But we don't start an uproar. We don't start a fight. We don't get you know, into chaos and then you get the council coming along, the police. They shut down the activities. That's the worst thing for the doubt. You want to have the upper, you know, the, 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 the mindset of wisdom <coughs> and long term is what you want to do in that. Yeah, you want to use the, 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 the wisdom basically. So that brother was very wise. Yeah, he was very wise. And you know, so this is, a, this is the sort of thing that we want to look out for. But no, end of the day, it is bad for them to throw it in the bin, no doubt. You know, it's got Islamic uh, content in there, information, and you don't want to see the material wasted as well. It costs our charity money to produce it, it costs our charity money to print the booklets and the leaflets. That's why we started producing a postcard, which I think I sent to Brother Faraz. What's your goal? It was linked to the Qatar World Cup, but you could use it for initiation. That postcard is only costing like one penny. So even if it goes in the bin, the words on there, what's your goal? What's the loss? It's one penny, you know what I mean? But a Quran in the bin is like one or two pounds, a lot of money for the charity. But look, end of the day, remember my key words, brother. 90% uh, of the doubt is rejection. Prophets were ridiculed, they were more, uh, uh, sorry, mocked, scorned, ridiculed, even attacked. Prophet Muhammad so went to die, he was stoned. So you're going to get some resistance, right? But it's how you react. So remember the key thing, brothers and sisters, some non-Muslims are looking for a big reaction. Yeah, they label the Muslims, some of them, the media, etc. They label us as terrorists. They want to see that in real life. They want to see the angry Muslims the guy at the Dawah school fighting and having a big fisty cups, you know, fighting someone in the Dawah school and having a swearing and getting mad. That's what they'd like to see, because that's what the perception of Muslims is. But when you shine with your character, your morals, your behavior, your good conduct, then it doesn't give them an excuse. Then they see the true piece of Islam and they come towards it. That's the key thing. Any other questions before we end? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, we won't on this occasion have any stand. We may have a table and chairs possibly if we can get some brothers to take it out there. But we don't need it. 
but it helps to focus the, the DAO of books, etc. But in the future, when we get the table set up uh, more long term, you can get these little apparatus, you know, like a little booth. I can get Brother Faraz the link. The brothers in London, Leicester yes. Square. They have a very nice little booth, excellent one. It's like a, a free Quran, it says on there. And normal Muslims come all day. This is the free Quran. Can I take one? Give me one. The, the, the non Muslims and Quran is just mind blowing. Um, you know, I've been, like I said, I travel a lot. I do like 30,000 miles a year just driving across the UK. I went to the Land's End in the tip of England and I met this young lady who's in the coffee shop. I'm giving her dawah about Islam and I'll go back to London. Here's a copy of the Quran and then I'll go to pay for my coffee as I'm leaving, right? Because I'm big on the caffeine because of all the mileage, right? So I'm saying to her, here's my money, here's a card to pay for the coffee. She said to me, no, you gave me that Quran, I'm not giving you the charge you for the coffee. You know, it's like the impact it has is phenomenal, you know, the books and the Qurans. The same happened in another time in Harwich. Same thing, you know, I went to, I didn't do this deliberately, I'm not trying to get free coffee, I'm giving them Quran for the dawah. I was giving them as a gift, and the man in the shop said, I'll leave you 50-50, and I was confused, what do you mean, 50-50? Do I pay half the bill? He said, no, he says, you gave me the Quran, so I'm going to give you the coffee free. So like, not in their heart of hearts, they're looking for this book, the non-Muslims, trust me. They're looking for the message of Islam, Quran, because they're in a spiritually dark place. We take it for granted. Salah, dhikr, ibadah, yeah, du'a. We take it for granted, almost to that point. You know, we've become so used to it, yeah? But it's such a rich world that we live in as Muslims. That these people live in a spiritually devoid of, where's Allah in their life? Where's God in their life? They don't, they don't have this connection. They're in a dark zone, you know? Like I said, no boundaries. Yeah, anything goes, anything can happen. You know, anything they can start, they can become addicted to alcohol by drinking a little bit too much. Next minute, they've lost their family, their job, gambling, habit, this and that, drink driving. So, uh, now, I say to non Muslims that if you become, if your daughter or son becomes a Muslim, say they're in their 20s, they can never die from drink driving if they follow Islam correctly and they don't indulge in that sort of thing. Uh, they'll never die from drink driving, it's a protection immediately. They'll never get a debt from gambling because we don't gamble. There's so many benefits in Islam as a way of life. That is just perfect. It's a perfect religion. Yeah, so this is amazing. So, any other further questions? Yeah, yes, brother, at the back. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, many of us uh, also observe this. Sometimes we have these so called a uh, witness of yoga. Yoga oh, yeah. at our Jehovah's doorsteps. Yes, yes. At our doorsteps. Yes. So, how to deal with those people to, to give them our. Instead yeah, of I mean, look, brother, the main thing is it's kind of what I covered in the course, you know, be good with them. You know, if they come in your house, invite them in, say to them, here's a gift of Quran and stuff like that. You know, give them a gift uh, of some book as well. Try to give them dawah because they're trying, they're very, what's the word you say, they're very motivated and enthusiastic in giving dawah to many folk. You need to be one step ahead. So you give them dawah rather than begging. But normally, from my experience and understanding from the brothers in the dawah and our work in our charity, these sort of people, they tend to run away from the Muslims anyway. They get scared and they pack their bags and go anyway. They kind of flee, you understand? But look, Christianity, it's a, I don't want to say in coarse terms, but it's a dying religion. It is the first time in this country, I'm born in this country, I'm 50 now, the first time in this country it's gone under 50%. It's the first time ever. So as a whole, you know, falsehood, you know, falsehood, Allah, it doesn't last, yeah? It, it dies eventually, right? So. It's becoming a dying thing, right? It's not, it's not practicing anymore. It's like, and Islam is growing. So the Christians, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, Seventh Day Adventists, all these people, they shouldn't perturb you. They shouldn't bother you. If anything, the thing to be careful of in your dawah, if you get an evangelical coming to the street dawah stall, evangelical preacher, just be careful because some of them are on a payroll. They're paid to waste the time of the Muslims. They do it deliberately. They'll come to a street dawah stall. They'll say, okay, let's debate about the Bible. Let's talk about John 55. And, and you'll notice three hours is gone and they just talk to you. And for them, they've done their mission because they diverted you away from giving dawah to another person and he maybe became a Muslim because they know Islam, the world's fastest growing religion. They've gone under 50%. Christianity is dying. Islam is growing. So they, they can't do anything about it. They've done everything with the media, with the money, with the think tanks, with the billions. They've tried to wipe out Islam. It hasn't worked. It's growing. So they're, they're mystified, they're bamboozled, right? So this preacher, don't get tricked by him. Don't give him the time of the day. Close it off if you can. Give him a Quran, a nice conversation. Let him go on his way. Some of them are troublesome as well. But don't get sucked into it. Think to yourself, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Remember what I said to you, brothers and sisters? Don't push the square peg in the round hole. 
focus on those folk out there that is maybe the spiritual guy, Khan, he's a uni guy or whatever, he's searching for the truth. He's your guy. Someone looking for the Quran. I've had so many encounters. People, they want to pay you money for the Quran. They're like, how much do we give you for this Quran? And we're like, no, it's free. And they cannot believe it. They're like, no way. You know, the guys in Glastonbury, where have you Muslims been? So the non-Muslims are screaming out for some spirituality, goodness of Islam, right? So this is what we're waiting for. Yeah, this girl's a fake Muslim. Yeah. Uh, I was a Muslim before. They asked them, read Surah Fatiha, they can't even do it. Or the, the very funny one is like, uh, which sex were you with in Islam when you were a Muslim? Biryani or tandoori? Or something like that. Well, not tandoori, some other words. Biryani or pilau? And the guys are oh, used to be pilau. You know, he doesn't even know what's oh, going on. I'm in her eyes with it too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>